Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is, uh, my name's Chris Mullins. Ray Gore. And this is Ray Gore. Ray Gore is our super <laughs> support person, super subject matter expert, and that's kind of reason why I'll be, I wanted to bring him in to help us with our topic today. And today we're gonna talk about CT testing tips. Um, and so Ray has years of experience when he was working with the utility before he came to Parametrics. And so I wanted to be able to, for him to share some of that uh, experiences with you, especially those who are using the PowerMaster sure, yeah. and, uh, and typically do CT testing every day. John Jones couldn't make it today. We apologize. Um, he's actually at a customer site uh, setting up a new test bench. Oh, good. Great. Yeah. So he's there this week, going to be training yeah. them, and so they're going to start their training program. So That's good. Really excited. Uh, I'm glad to see that people are really, you know, having a positive response to okay. our to the test benches that we're showing. I think people can finally see that all the things you can simulate with it, right? For sure. Yeah. You see now uh, nowadays uh, the older heads we're leaving, and you know it's great to have a test bench to help out with that training. So that's exactly. a good. Uh, yeah, it's a good, great deal. All right. Well, let's get into it, guys. So this is our quarantine series 14 now. Um, so today, we're, again, we're going to be talking about the CT testing tips with our subject matter expert, Ray. Uh, our plan for the next couple weeks, uh, we're going to talk about this rise of solar installations um, with the, these, uh, these uh, three-phase self-contained, like a 12S, well, a single-phase 12S, and a three-phase 16S has become more and more popular. So we want to talk about that and what kind of applications you guys may be facing. Uh, we're also, this is by request last week, uh, a customer asked about if we could talk about demand metering. So we're going to discuss that one as well. Okay. And a lot of programming will take place in the 12S and 16S meter, right, to actually some forward and uh, reverse. So that's going to be, that's going to be something really to see there. Yeah. And demand testing too. Okay. Here's our agenda. Agenda. What we're going to talk about today. Types of CT installations, yep. a review of flex probe, a review of high voltage probe by SensorLink. Where do I place my probe? An overview of PowerMaster settings and data interpretation. Yep. So we'll talk about the you know the three basic installations you guys are going to run across when you're when you're doing CT testing on the PowerMaster, and then we're going to kind of show the two main probes that we use for the CT testing portion, okay. which is going to be a flex probe and the high voltage probe or the SensorLink probe, one of the two. And then I know Ray gets this question a lot on support calls is, okay, I got my probe, but where do I place it? You yeah, know, what do, I, what do sure. I do with it? If and it's a high voltage probe or a sensor or the uh, uh, flex ring, it's like, hey, I'm out here, where do I place my probe? Yes. So we'll go over that today, show you. And then we're also gonna quickly show you how to uh, set up your test, your air limits, yeah. Uh, some utilities have a wider tolerance and some have a very narrow tolerance. So we're going to show you how to do that. And then we're going to do a quick data interpretation of what would a CT test result look like on the screen and how can you interpret those, those results. So the very common uh, installation that the meter technicians run across is a commercial. Most of the three phase stuff is going to look like this. Uh, it's going to be less than 600 volts always. Uh, CTs can be mounted in, in a pad mount. In this example here in the picture, there's actually three CTs mounted in the pad, right? Um, or there's another option where it could be maybe an older installation or based on how the service, service is wired and there may be an aerial or an overhead where the CTs and PTs are mounted on an overhead pole. Um, this may or may not have PTs. It kind of depends on, on the, basically the utility, really. I mean, what would the reason why they wouldn't have PTs on this particular site? Well, it could be a 12208 transformer installation, so uh, they probably wouldn't require PTs. Uh, of course, if it's 277480, some utilities might uh, require uh, PTs. Uh -huh. But in that situation like that, that you see there in the picture now, you're looking, thinking, hey, can I just place my, uh, my flex rings at the bottom of the CTs instead of at the top? So we'll get into that. It really doesn't really matter. I would look at it as the safest place I can actually install my flex probes and uh, get my job done and get out of there. What kind of CTs are in this picture? Uh, that looks like to me a bar top CT. So um, again, those are actually um, 
actually mounted to the conductor itself, sort of. So um, again, you want to make sure you have all the safety equipment available and make sure you're using it when you're doing this. Gotcha. Uh, another one not as common, but they do have, uh, you will run across some primary installations that you got out there. They're going to be over, they're going to be up above 600 volts. Yeah, 600 um, volts. Possibly up to 14.4? Yes, sir. Okay. Possibly up to 14.4 kV. And I've seen both. I've seen a lot of the ones I've seen have been mounted on, on poles. They're aerial or overhead, but I know there's a lot of, of pad mount applications as well. Like, for yeah. example, in this picture, you can see the uh, CTs mounted on the top part and the PTs mounted at the bottom. So right. there is, PTs are always going to be present, right? Right, exactly. So in this particular application too, is I would, uh, you're going to actually use your high voltage probe. And the thing of it is on this is I've seen, I've talked to guys saying, hey, can I just use my hand to do that? You don't want to do that. You want to use your high volt, your, uh, your high voltage um, uh, stick there mm -hmm. and mount the probe on the conductor and test that site. Uh, under any circumstances, you do not want to use your hand on the probe. Sure. Simple is simple. Uh, just attach it to your stick and you're good to go. Okay. And you also want to make sure that that conductor is behind the indention part of the fork as well. Uh, last one we're going to discuss is a substation application. Okay. These are always going to be primary. So typically you're going to see up to 69 kV on, on these distribution side uh, substations. Um, CTs, primary CTs are always going to be present, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, what's so critical about this is that it is a, <laughs> it's, it's a billing point, right? It's a billing point transfer form between the generation point and the distribution where it gets to the customers, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's critical so infrastructure for sure. This is definitely a critical part to make sure that this installation, the CTs and the meter is correct, correct. Exactly. because it can be a huge billing problem. Exactly, and it can be complicated figuring out where you test the CTs too. Yes, and we have a great so, example of on, on later on this presentation of where a customer sent a, sent a picture, it was a substation, and he was trying to figure out, okay, where do I put my probe? Yeah. And it's, a good, it's a good question. Yeah. And we can always FaceTime. If you guys call, FaceTime me, and you know, I can, we can FaceTime, and you can actually show me the structure, and I can actually tell you where to place the probe. So let's get our, our most common probe that people purchase from us is always the flex probe, right? Yes, sir. Can you give us kind of a rundown of okay. what the flex probe is for? What do you use it for? Okay, so more than likely you will use this probe, uh, such as in your transformer, 600 volts and below. Um, it is a 600 volt, 3000 amp, um, and it's flexible. And you know, of course, you can actually, um, double wrap or you can actually single wrap and the cool thing about it is it's got a natural row to it so if you use that around the conductors it would help you to where you're not actually placing your whole entire arm inside the transformer um, but i wouldn't recommend using the natural roll of the probe when you're installing this and another thing you might want to do is you might want to bend down and install them so that's why i was trained to do and it works very well that way make sure you have your hard hat on and that way, you're nowhere near the bushings of the transformer. So, and another thing, kind of keep it clean. Um, I notice a lot of guys, you know, they all use a lot of that grease inside the transformer there. And time you pull them out or whatnot, you end up having a bunch of grease. And, you know, uh, it tends to gum up. And once it gums up inside here, then you've got issues. Mm -hmm. So kind of keep this clean and use denatured alcohol on them and you should be good to go. What about polarity? Uh, polarity reversal and polarity is a big thing here. Um, these probes do have an arrow on it. I don't know if you guys can see. Can you see the arrow? Hold on. Got it. Okay. Make sure that is the direction of current flow there. So, of course, we're going to go toward the load. Toward the load. Yes, sir. Okay. So, I mean, they work really good. I've used them for years. They're safe. Um, I've used them 18 years, so... Uh, they're, they're really good. You take care of them, they'll last you forever. Here's an interesting fact that our customers may not know. You don't have to connect the flex probes together, do you? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
Um, but uh, I, I've actually got a reading with them, not actually fully connected, yeah. so it will work. Um, but um, it's just something that I, I was trained to do, so I just make sure I hear the log. Yeah. So, but th they're great probes, and I would say this too, also on these, you've got the little clips here. Um, just try to keep the inside of it clean. That's it, and you know, I just make sure it clips. Can you show the, show the camera clips again real quick? Yes, sir. Just letting people know that those, these clips that Ray are showing, those may break, but we can replace those when we, when we stop yeah, we those clips. Stops, yeah. yeah, and they're very easy to replace. Yeah, and you don't want to grab, normally I was training a couple of people and they, once you have the natural roll of the probe itself around your conductors, and the first thing you want to do is once you're done, you release, and then you want to pull this but well, what happens is this tip here tends to get in between conductors and that actually is epoxied on there so you don't want to pull that gotcha. so you want to take care of these ends here and i'm and these probes will last you forever so what's going on here in this box and uh, that box i think what that does is that's something we actually do right yes so we actually that's our deal here so that's actually our communication we have a communication in this i guess that's the eprong yeah, so we have a printed circuit board mounted in, in this, in the box. Okay. That kind of, it's like, it's, it's another, it's a power. So there's no external power you need. The power actually generated from the power master into this connector. And Ray is correct that at the end of this connector, there is an EEPROM, which stores a calibration values. Yeah. So you can move that probe from one analyzer to the next without risk of uh, reducing your calibration. Yeah. And I will say too, um, when you place the probe in the transformer, sometimes, or well, I could say majority of the time, you will either have to adjust. You know, you can either adjust. What I normally do is go either clockwise or counterclockwise to get the best. Well, here's a good example. To get the best reading. And that is so, a very yeah, good example. So where do we place that probe? So I've okay. got a, what, what installation is this? Okay, so that looks like a pad mount transformer there to me, X1, X2, X3. Uh, you do have three CT, so that's telling me more than likely that's a form 9S meter. Um, and you've got three CTs, but the thing of it is, is you notice that the CTs are not actually on the bushing. They're actually floating. It's what I call floating CT. So Sitting at the bottom of the pad. Sitting at the bottom of the pad mount. So the way he's got it set up here, what I would do is a, immediately look at the very bottom of the transformer and see how many conductors are going through that CT. Then I would find out which CT, which conductor is going through the CT, and that's where I place my probe. How many conductors are going through each CT? Uh, it looks like to me one. Yeah, that's what I see too. Yeah. So you've got uh, three conductors in the transform. Mm -hmm. Is that typical? Uh, yeah, if you've got uh, multiple people feeding off of the same transformer. Um, I'm more than likely that's something commercial maybe it could be a business that has that's that's got two meters in the business in the building so but yeah that's yeah you'll see a lot of that and notice in the picture too that the, the technician is checking polarity right of yeah the probe. he is checking polarity of that probe yep. yeah so that's a big thing um but again he could have easily you know where he's got the probes place is a good safe way i would not recommend in this particular picture here is let's say for example if the ct was actually mounted on the bushing if i was doing this i would probably use my low voltage blankets on x1 and x3 and set my probes up if gotcha. i'm going to reach in there right and would you use the method you talked about where you kind of let the, yeah. let the natural roll yeah, around the conductor roll. yes sir okay. keeps you out of the out of out of those bushings and um everything you're doing is safe okay cool and our second most popular probe, I would say, is our high voltage probe. Now, you need to have these for, for, high, for primary installations or high voltage yeah. ap ap applications. Yes, sir. So it's got a 250 volt KV max, 250 KV max rating with a 2000 amp uh, yes, rating on the, on the current. Um, we do have to mount this on a hot stick. Yes, and it's very important when we talk about mounting it on a hot stick. Um, I've trained a lot of people using this hot stick and I still have my hands, fingers and all this good stuff, my toes, so I'm doing things right here. So, um, but what I normally do is 
when I'm doing the test in a, in, in a substation or in a transformer, I keep this away from all concentric wire. And if I'm doing a, a substation or a transformer job that we just showed you, my fork will be like this. Why is that? Well, the thing of it is the angle you're, is working against you. So the thing of it is you want to be able to get all the conductor behind this indention part of the probe. That's actually your window for measurement accuracies. Okay? So <clears throat> when you're performing this test, the safe way to do this is to mount this probe like this, and then you extend your stick, and then you place it on the conductor. Now, if I was doing a standard test out in the field on, let's say, a commercial, McDonald's or whatever, and it's aerial, I'm going to set my probe up like that at an angle. And the reason why I do that is because I've done this. I can tell you how many times, and if I place this thing on a 90, like, like that, that, yeah. Like that, yeah. guess what? It's really hard to remove off the conductor. So what you have to do is you have to kick the bottom of the pole out, just to, this your hot stick, just to get it out away from your conductor, because it's going to wedge down in there. It's actually going to set down on the cable itself, and that cable is going to be somewhere right around about here. So you have to bend the stick to get it out of there. So that's why I always mount it like that, or you might want to mount it like that. That way you can remove it. So, <clears throat> so the thing that you have to watch out for is keep this away from all conductors, bare conductors, and keep your hot stick clean. And you know, once you use the moisture eaters and all that good stuff on it, once it starts getting stiff, and keep your probe clean. So, um, and I know I'm skipping here, Chris, but another good thing is this thing has a battery here and it has a battery here, okay? So when you talk to me and I ask you if you've changed the batteries, you will remove this and exchange the batteries. Now there's little gaskets on these screws and these screws have little red little gaskets on it. If you can, leave those gaskets on there and do not over tighten these little, these little, uh, I guess plastic caps. Yeah, I've seen it over tighten and it actually yeah. cracks the yeah. uh, the plastic. They start to crack in the corners here, right. and that's not good. So, um, and of course, keep it clean. The manual states that you have to at least have 8.6 uh, voltage for that probe to work properly. So I tell folks. Just to be clear, everyone, that this these both sides requires a nine volt battery. Yes, sir. And the head and the display. Yeah. So, and I will say, make sure you have at least 8.7, 8.6 volts in both of those, in the receiver and the, the fork. Uh, and keep it clean. Um, that's the most important thing you wanna do. I will say this, and I know I'm getting off subject here, but I wanna make sure everybody gets what they need out of it. Um, <clears throat> if you ever notice that you're having some issues with your reading, you can actually remove these two screws here and get some compressed air and blow into the DB9 connector and then uh, reinstall it and it should be good to go. So that's another good little thing. Keep this clean, uh, keep debris out of the little connection in there and you should be good to go. How do you take care of the fiber? Uh, the fiber, you can use denatured alcohol on it too. Just put it on a rag and clean it. Um, and periodically just check, make sure there's no cuts or anything like that on it, even as far as with the probe too. Mm -hmm. Um, can you use I, the denatured alcohol on both the probe and the, and the cable? Yeah, you sure can. And okay. just make sure, you know, you let it, uh, put it on a rag and then wipe it down and then let it dry really well before you use it. And like I said, I've, I've used those since 1997, 98 and never had any problems with them. Um, and oh, most important thing I meant to show you guys is... Show that camera. Um, don't let me drop something. If you can see this little porcelain tip, you might want to take some alcohol and clean that too, because uh, half the time it turns like a grayish color on it. So keep that clean as well. And then of course, when you install it, you're not going to do anything rough here. You're just going to barely press in there and turn that cap. And try your best to keep these little caps here. That's a protection for the ceramic piece.
So, what about strain relief? Strain relief is a very important thing as well. Um, here's a strain. Thanks for mentioning that, Chris. Let me show you this. Here's your strain relief here, and there's a little retainer here that you can actually go up here and attach this. Uh, don't have my glasses on, but that's how it kind of works there. And it kind of supports the fiber. That kind of supports the fiber. So I will say this, if you're still needing uh, a better support, is you can actually take you a Velcro and just take a Velcro strap around the tip of your hot stick and it'll do the same thing. Mm -hmm. If you don't have, if this is broken, that's what you can do. Right. But if you have this, utilize it because it actually supports your fiber. It takes all the weight off of this right here. Okay. All right. So, so when, they, when they when they when they want to use it, so they got the hot stick mounted. They verified it's clean. They've got their PPE on. They're mounting. They're going to mount the. Oh, they're getting ready to do the CT test. Okay. Tell me how do I power everything on? So what I what you want to do is. <coughs> And this is actually one of the older probes where you still have the display. Yeah. So what you want to do is if everyone, let me take this over here, Chris. Yep. Good, good like question. Um, what you want to do is I normally turn the receiver on first. So press that and I got my little dots, right? And then I'm going to turn this guy on and I should have a decimal. Is that a decimal? Yeah. I turned yep. it off. Okay. So once that decimal comes up there, it's actually in a short range, right? Is that right? Yes, and it's a short timeout range. Exactly. So you have a short time to get it up there on the conductor. If I hit it one more time, you have 9 minutes and 45, 48 seconds to get up there on the pole. Yep. So I use this. I call it the high range. I use this when I'm utilizing uh, a primary that I've got a pole that's like 40 or 50 foot pole. And so I definitely use this range. For those who may have the newer style, which doesn't have the display, what would your recommendation be for that? For the newer style, the only thing you would do is, um, it, I, I don't think it actually times out. But I do know on the newer probe, you just need to make sure you turn it off because it'll uh, you know, stay on. Yeah, so when you do turn it on, there's a, there's a green LED that yes, powers sir. up to let you know that it's on. Mm -hmm. And then if you guys ever notice that, that, that LED flashes, that means that uh, it's detecting at least one amp of current. Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. And then I think if it's um, if it's off, it doesn't communicate with a with a receiver. Is that correct? Yeah, if it's off, there's no there's no communication. And if the fiber cable is bad or there's no communication, you get a red light okay. on the LED. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. All right. And so, one more I, so if I'm done, oh go go ahead. Sorry. Uh, one more thing I want to say this is once you're done, let's say you get out there and you're not reading anything on here. So actually. Uh, you can actually remove this, remove the fiber cable um, here, and you can actually hold your hand over it. You can actually see a little red light in these little tips here, hmm. and that tells you that more than likely probably your cable's bad. Gotcha. Good to know. So, all right. So, so how do I power it off? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to power it off. So I normally turn this guy off first. I hold it down. Okay. Now we're not communicating. So we got three dashes here. So I got three dashes. Right. And then I power it off to the receiver. Yep. Thanks, Chris. That's good there. I forgot about that. All right. All right. So let's talk about um, a real application. Okay. You know, a customer, he's, he's walked into a substation. And um, so he's got his power master out, hooked up to the meter. Now he's going to do a CT test. Ray, where the heck do I put my probe on? So what, okay. what, what's going on with this installation? So, that insulation there is a substation insulation, and actually this is actual picture of a customer actually sent to me and said, hey, where do I place my probe? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. This is what actually happened in that process, is what he was doing is he was placing his probe, and he wasn't getting all the conductors behind the indention part of the fork. So remember, guys, when you place this on your conductor it can't you can't see anything i mean in other words you can't place it to where you have two conductors where they're splitting off so you've got to find one conductor that you can actually place this in to make a correct measurement so that measurement where we actually okay so where we actually placed 
the fork is right there if you look underneath right near the before it goes up to the switch there yes yeah, so you'll this, see so what we're showing here in this in this picture are the actual cts right yes so sir. these are mounted up and so the uh i know you were helping the customer out and he was putting it in a wrong place right, right. He was actually putting it right where the arrow is at. But, and see the conductors, how they spread out right there? So he was getting uh, erroneous numbers and crazy readings. and Yeah, so he was, he was putting his probe right there, right? Yeah. On the yeah. backside. Yeah. So he was coming around. What kind of angle did he have his probe on? Um, the way, I think the picture showed the way his, he had his angle of his probe. Um, I can't, can we back up? Yeah. It's oh, back up, sorry. Yep. So is that where... I think it's the next, is it next picture? I think he had it. Okay, so that's oh, not in this picture. I think yep. the way he had his probe was straight up and down. Straight up and so down. in other words, he had it like this, in which is halfway, you know, fank in there because what he was probably thinking is he could get it like this. And I think what happened was it was just too wide. You do not want to wedge this between those conductors. Yeah, so, so he was, again, he was kind of going you know, right, yeah. right at the back end where those two conductors are, and he was he was getting half the current, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And the and the weird thing about it is, remember, this is the sensitive parts of the probe, is yeah. the tips. So the correct place to put it is over here in the front, yes, right around where it's coming across. Right um, by the bypass switch is the way it looks to me. Yeah, okay, so there's a bypass switch right there in front. So he's able to get, so what, how kind of angle did he have to do to get to get that? On that particular um, site there, what I would probably do is I would probably angle it in a way to where um, it's at the actual angle that I'd probably use for commercial. Yeah. It's because I wouldn't want to get, in other words, you're going between two phases. So I would probably angle it a little bit at an angle, or if you want to get on the other side, in other words, you can come all the way on to the right side and angle it just like he had it and get uh, the conductor. But I'd probably angle it a little bit just to get all that conductor inside that floor. Gotcha. <clears throat> and the test came out okay? And the test came out okay, yeah. And I think he spent like 30, 30 something minutes out there on that job. So right. again, it's best, if all possibility, to FaceTime me, call, um, and if I'm on the phone, send me a text. It's what everybody's doing now. Yeah. And um, what they'll do is we'll FaceTime and say, just show me what's going on and I can kind of tell you a safe place to place the probe. Gotcha. Um, let's go over the, um, Jared, we're gonna switch over to the camera on the PowerMaster and Ray's gonna show settings okay. on the PowerMaster for air limits. Okay. Okay, so let me get me some glasses on here so I can see what we're doing. All right, so let's go to what we'll do is go to utilities. And then what we'll do is we'll go to user preferences. Uh, you can just go up here and hit eight. Save some time. Now I got my glasses fogging up from the, <laughs> from the, <laughs> from the. Okay, so here you have error test limits. So, and again, we are in user preferences on page one of 10, okay? So you have meter test error limits, and I think we default to one time spec. I'm pretty sure that's what we do, which is uh, 0.2. Uh, and then we've got CT test error limits, and I think we default to, I think, three on that as three well. Three times spec. So at 100% rated load, let's say it's a non-extended range CT, 100% rated load of 105. So you're looking at... So 100 20. amps on 105 CT would, would fall in the 0.3% accuracy range. Exactly. Now, if it was 99 amps all the way down to 10 amps, that accuracy range would fall at 0.6%. Because it doubles. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So you're looking at 0.3. If it's set at default, you're looking at 0.3 at, if, if you're saying three times spec, then you're looking at 0.9 and you're looking at 1.8, right? Yes. Okay. So, and you also can set your PT error limits there as well. Yeah, gotcha. 
So I know we get some questions about that because the customer is asking, why am I getting a fail message? And it may just be as simple as that the air tolerance is too tight. Yeah. Now, yeah. should I expect 0.3% air out in the, or air in the, in the field? Well, you, I mean, it, it's a possibility because uh, that's just really stringent. So um, I would look to somewhere right around about 2% uh, mm. is what I would set this up as. Um, Do you think as long as the CT ratio test is within 2%, we're, yeah, we're in good shape? Yeah, yeah, we're in good shape. Gotcha. Uh, just because the CT fails at uh, 0.9, that doesn't mean that it's a bad CT, you know, so. But anyway, um, but that's where you would set all this up at. Um, so now that you have it set up, let's run a quick, you know, CT test on a typical commercial pad mount installation. Okay. So we're going to do that. Okay. And everybody knows how, let me go back because I'm just uh, moving around. So what I did was I went in before the presentation and I actually set up a site into this three series. All right, so instead of me doing an integrated site test, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do an instrument transformer test. So it's just something short. And then I'm gonna go and select instrument transformer testing. And then I'm gonna do a CT customer load test. And it's detecting my probe. Okay, so I've got my burden and ratio here. That's what I wanna do. So I want to actually apply a burden and I want to um, I want to see a ratio out of it with the applied burden. So my max burden here is 0.5. And uh, here you got the, so, uh, you could either double wrap or single wrap. So I've got it single wrap. So I'm going to go ahead and start this. Am I running time? Am good. I running over time? Nope, you're good. Okay. And then, of course, this, you could use these the wiring schematic here to place your probes, which so is really that, good. That screen's important. Yes, so sir. let's say for example, what would happen if your probe was not connected at that time? Um, if it's not connected, it would actually show a, um, a black dot. Well, like a clear dot, like right here, you see primary yep. uh, B and primary C, I've, since I've only got one probe. So that's actually green there. So it's just a clear dot if you don't, you know, if you're not using the other two probes. Yep. So it's the probes that's black, isn't it? Sometimes, isn't it some of the probes or the duck bills black? I've seen some black. They're black if they're being used. Okay. Uh, if it's missing, it'll show up as red. Okay. And then you have a message the, at the bottom that will say. Unidentified un probe. No, it says missing probe. Or missing probe. Yeah. So the Power Master will let you know you know, if you, if you don't have the probe connected to. So Ray has hooked up just one flex probe uh, on the installation. And so that's why it kind of flashes and gives you time to set the probe and then you tell it when to start the test. Correct. So now it's waiting on me. And it's got here, move probe to phase A and press F6 to start, start test. Mm -hmm. Guys have always asked, what is that clicking noise in the analyzer? So it's actually the relays clicking, right? Yes. Okay. So I have a pass there. Uh, this is a 200 to 5 CT, right? That's right. And I notice that even though it says 200 to 5, I've trained myself that I'm going to actually look at the CT and verify that it's a 200 to 5 CT. So guys, get used to doing that. And I've got a pass here. So. You can actually do the math yourself if you wanted to. So you're sitting here looking at your primary amps and you're sitting here looking at your secondary amps. So you can divide your primary into your secondary, multiply by five and actually get the measured ratio, right? Yeah. And you can actually do it a little bit different by getting your, uh, let's see, if that's a 200 to five CT, the multiplier will be 40. So you can actually take 40 and the secondary current and get the primary current, right? Yep. So isn't that cool? So what would happen if, if I got a fail? What would cause a failure? Well, um, a couple of things. Um, let's say you have a failed on a CT itself, 
Mm -hmm. And let's say more than likely, like the picture we saw, you might need to reposition your flex ring a little bit. Okay. Let's say, for example, you mess the conductor. Let's say that this might be a little lower, you know, so it failed. Go back and check yourself. Go back and make sure. Um, hey, let's try that, that open like you were talking about. Uh, but go back and check yourself and see how well it does. Let's see if that actually works. Yeah, so we're going to try an experiment to yeah. see if, without connecting the Flex Pro, do we still get a good test? I believe the answer is yes. I believe it is too because I've seen it. While we're waiting for the test, I have a question from the chat. When and why would you need to double wrap? Well, here's what I, when, I, when you're saying double wrap to me, it actually fails. Oh, okay. Um, I would double wrap a flex probe when I've got one or two conductors and the reason why is because that window is so big. So what you want to do is you want to double wrap and get a smaller measurement between those conductors and your probe. Agree with that? Chris? Yeah. So, so yeah, you're trying to reduce the amount of, of area that could cause any kind of phase problems or especially I usually like to double wrap so I don't touch the other conductors or the other flex probes that are yeah. that are next to it. That seems to help as well. Yeah. Because there are a lot of installations out there that have very, very tight cabinets, exactly. CD cabinets, and it's sometimes it's just a challenge getting those flex probes in there. For sure. Okay, so um did we miss so I guess, I guess, I, I, guess our, I guess our experiment failed. Maybe it, maybe you can't disconnect. You can't it's I'll better to connect yeah. it. It is better. It is better. Um, matter of fact I had one that inside of a three-phase pad mount transformer is again i've you know always talked to bend down and attach the probe at the natural roll but what happens is when it comes around guess what it might be a little tight because what happens is all the conductors start to flare out at the bottom in the transformer so sometimes it don't always work unless you can you know push the probe up a little bit but that's where i found out that it actually works doing that yep gotcha anything else um no, if, uh, if you had three flex probes, typically, that, that, if you had three flexes all hooked up, would that make the testing any different? It's just faster. Um, <clears throat> what I like to do is instead of it asking me right now to go to the next phase, uh, what it's doing now is just telling me if you had three flex probes, it would just go ahead and test each, each uh, service. Sequentially, uh, right. Yeah, yep. all together, and so it's, it's a done, you're done. If you're, so, if, you're using a, if you're using a high voltage probe, this is the only really chance you've got to do it, right? Unless you have three yeah. high voltage probes. Yeah. But typically most of you just have the one. So yeah. Just most move it from one probe to the, one phase to the next. Exactly, yes. A lot of people just use one probe. Um, like I said, it, I mean, they, I'm telling you, they work really well. I've used them for a long time. And, you know, the thing of it is, is just remember when you're placing these on the conductor, don't get them in a bind don't force them and they will last forever so um enough with that uh we explained how to do the probes with a fork anything else on the flex rings no we did hey by the way we make a what 36 and a 48 length right yeah we also make a 36 and a 48 yes and okay. bo both of them could be double wrapped so 30 is good note into 18 and then a 48 can go down to 24. okay so that's good to know. I had yep. a lot of guys call about this. And 3,000 amps, right? 3,000 amps, yes. Okay. Uh, one thing you may want to show them is that if they do double wrap, is there anything they need to tell the power master? Yes, sir. So let's see. If we go in and we actually double wrap, and then we would actually go, let me hit previous here. And then here. Right here, you would actually place double wrap. And if and you didn't, telling, what would happen? Well, it actually calculates it to show a 400 to 5 CT instead of a 200 to 5 CT. Gotcha. So be aware of that. Okay. If you see that and you didn't select it, you know I don't have a bad CT. I just double wrap and didn't tell the machine. Okay. Uh, let's see, are we missing anything? Do you mind quickly going over uh, interpreting the parallelogram and the I plots? I sure can. 
So what we have here now, I got to put my old man glasses on. I'm sorry, guys. But that's why you need a training bench here, by the way. <laughs> All right, let's see here. Um, so, <clears throat> well, what we have here is, um, now again, I'm old school, so you've got the y-axis and the x-axis, right? So the y-axis is, is up top, right, where you see the actual parallelogram, and the x-axis is the actual horizontal. So the vertical is y, horizontal is x, right? So the percent error is y, and the and the uh, time in minutes is X. So what you're looking at is your user-defined fields here. So your user-defined fields is saying that um, the smaller square is 0.3, I'm assuming, and the larger square is your 1.8. So it would be 0.3 and 0.6 is what you're looking at. Yep. So if you look over to the ratio error, um, you're looking at your burden plots, right? You're looking at, you went all the way up to a full ohm on burden and you're looking at the secondary current change at those uh, different uh, burden so points. Typically, would you, would you see this in a common installation, this type of test? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Everything's not perfect? <laughs> he's laying right on top of everything. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't see that typically at an no. installation. So no. you're, you're going to see your secondary current change is going to do a decline, right? So yeah. it's going to kind of go like, kind of go down like yeah. this. Same thing, probably for your ratio error, it seems to follow yeah. sight. So that's normal, yeah. because as you add more additional burden, you should see less secondary exactly. current at the test switch. So in other words, you're telling me that, uh, and that's very good. So you're telling me that, as a, it, it, let's say if my CT is a 0.2 and I run it up to 0.5, so I'm going to look at that number or that plot, and it's going to go way out left field, right? Yep. Okay. So if there's a problem, like there's an actual problem with the resistance or there's a loose connection, okay. it's going to do this. Okay. It's going to go skyrocket way down. Exactly. It's not going to do the slow thing. No. That's normal reaction for a transformer where you add more burden to it. It's going to go straight down. Immediately. Immediately. Yeah. And, your, and then your parallelogram is going to scatter out as well. Virgil wants to know, what is the lowest current they will read? Which ones? Uh, the, um, the flex probe, the lowest oh. it, it will go down is 5 amps primary. That's the lowest it will go down. Yeah. The high voltage probe claims one amp. However, you might not get a passing, but it, it'll measure it. It will measure one amp. I believe it's more like about five amps. Yeah. That's what I think. As I well. agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Ira that. wants to know what causes phase, phase angle and ratio errors? What causes phase angle and ratio errors? I know Ira. Well, <laughs> I can tell you this, so what is it actually, what are we actually saying? So it's actually saying the reason why he's getting the air is the secondary current and the primary current are a good ways away from each other, right? Yes. In the sine wave. So what would cause that? Okay, well, I've seen it to where in a substation application, you could be, you could have this probe mounted in the wrong area when you're trying to take your measurement. Yeah, the, uh, the most easiest way to say that is if, if I'm on the wrong phase, I get a possible cross phase connection and yep. I get a 120 degree phase error. Phase, yeah. Uh, if I had the polarity wrong, like if I had it going backwards, that would give me a 180 degree phase shift, which will give me a possible polarity reversal. Okay. Now, the, those are pretty easy, right? Yes. yes. The ones that are a little bit more harder to determine, Complex. the ones that are like a couple degrees or right. two degrees or something like that. So that's what Ray was referring to is that if there is a measurement yeah. difference between what I'm measuring at the meter versus what I'm measuring at the CT, that's where there's a problem. Now, exactly. what would cause a phase error? Uh, it's probably going to be something to do with um, installation, yeah, we're degradation of the CT. Yeah. Or a two -boat con a two, you got a two-boat connector that's highly oxidized or whatever. I've seen that, but now again, like you're saying, those numbers will be very small, be like a two or three degrees. But yeah. if they're high, like the 60, you know, you're on the wrong conductor. I've seen uh, high harmonic distortion, like 40, 50 yeah. percent, that will cause a, uh, an error on both phase and, and amplitude. Yeah, hard to measure too. Hard to measure, in other words, using a flex ring on it, because I had a guy from uh, here in Tennessee having those problems. Using with the flex bro? Yeah. Yep. So. Virgil wants to know if you see many magnetized CTs. 
I've never, magnetized. I've never personally seen a magnetized CT. I've never. Have you? No, I haven't. Um, the only closed CT that I've seen something like that is it had to do with temperature. In other words, um, I went and tested the installation early in the morning and got my test results. Hey, CT is good. Billing is calling me saying, well, no, it's not. Um, you know, something's going on. So I went back on my way back into the shop and retested, and guess what? The CT was open. So it had to do something uh, with temperature inside the transformer. Gotcha. So that's the only one I've ever seen like that. And it was actually swelling at the bottom where it had linked up against the wall. The transformer got hot and opened up. Yep. So one important thing is, I want to say this before we get off here too, is when you're testing primary installations, I was testing, I was out testing, I was new at testing, and everybody makes a mistake. But what was so funny is I went out to test it, and they were telling me that they were already, that the site was already ready to go, it needed to be tested. So I went out there and tested, said, well, no, there's no current there. So I done my tests, uh, you know, just done my vectors to show there's no current, got in the truck, drove off. As I was waiting to get out, of the guard there was a line there. I looked in my review mirror, and I looked, and I went, oh, no, the bypasses are closed <laughs> But pay close attention to your bypass switches for sure. You know, mm. if you're testing, make sure they're open and all the current is going through the meter and not with the bypass closed. And that was a lot of money too. Yeah, I'm sure. How long was that? How long was that a problem? <laughs> About three months. <laughs> so I went out there and, you know, they, no one told me that it was ready. And so I just kept going out there. And then all of a sudden I just happened to look at my review mirror and go, wait a minute. Those switches are closed in. <laughs> it was on us. So, <laughs> all right. Any more questions, Jared? Yes, sir. All right. Let's wrap it up. All right. So Let's I appreciate everyone for uh, stopping in and saying hi, especially the yeah. questions too. Those are those are great. Uh, so upcoming next week, we're going to be talking about self-contained meters and solar sites, um, and then the week after that, we're going to talk about demand metering. That was actually a request by Virgil Johnson. So thank you, Oh, Virgil. really? Virgil, yep. I ain't talked to him in a long time. Yep. Good guy. Good guy. Enjoy. So we will see you guys next week. Hope you all have a good week. And um, see you then. See you then. Stay prayed up. Thank you all. See you.